I'm going to talk about my new book, which is uh, Keys to Teaching Grammar to English Language Learners, a Practical Handbook, Mich University of Michigan Press. And um, one of the questions I get asked frequently is why I would write a book like this. And I've always wanted to write a book on grammar for teachers. It's a natural extension of what I've done my whole life, which is teaching grammar to English language learners all over the world, here in the United States, in Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, Japan, Kuwait, um, and uh, in intensive programs, as well as at uh, university levels, and I've taught children the whole gamut, uh, adults as well, but no matter what kind of course I was teaching, and of course there, there always was a grammar component, even teaching young children there's a grammar component. And, a question that I'm asked frequently now when I do these workshops, especially for the K-12 uh, teachers, is are these things written down anywhere? Because obviously a lot of these ESL grammar rules that you and I know, if you're an experienced ESL teacher, are things the average native speaker doesn't know. So let me talk first a little bit about the overview, the, the layout of what's in this, this book. The book has five chapters. The first chapter is an overview of what is ESL or EFL, or Grammar for English Language Learners. And how is that different from what you and I, as a native speaker, studied when we were in eighth grade? For example, the eight parts of speech. Um, well, we learned that there were eight parts of speech, but in reality, in the ESL world, we don't teach grammar that way. It's not organized by the eight parts of speech. In fact, we don't even cover eight parts of speech. We only cover seven. Which one is missing? Well, the one that's missing is interjections, because uh, think about it. In the ESL books that you've taught from, if you are an experienced teacher, there is never a chapter on interjections. Your students are using those a lot. You don't want them to be using them, unfortunately. But um, that's a good example of the difference between the traditional grammar for native speakers and the grammar that you would teach to ESL students or EFL students. But that's what that chapter one talks about. What's the difference between the two kinds of grammar there? They're not the same. Another example I would give really quickly there is if you studied Spanish or French, if you're an English speaker, probably the, the, when you took a foreign language in school, you studied Spanish or French. It takes the Spanish example, for example. Uh, those things that you studied in Spanish class about when to put el and when to put la or if it's masculine or feminine or how to conjugate verbs or any of those things, direct objects preceding uh, verbs, I promise you that in Mexico there are no mothers running around chasing four-year-olds correcting uh, gender of nouns. This is truly a Spanish as a second language kind of grammar mistake and that's exactly what we're doing in ESL but in reverse obviously. So that's chapter one. Chapter 2 does talk about uh, parts of speech and basically serves as a review for those of us who have had some grammar training but a long, long time ago. And let's face it, most teachers that I run into are afraid of grammar. There are those of us who love grammar, but the average teacher, especially novice teachers, uh, they're afraid of grammar. And their template, their uh, default button, unfortunately, is to go back to their 8th grade grammar class with, of diagramming and having your hand slapped for saying irregardless, which is not a word. Um, that's their, their template in their head, but that's not what teaching grammar is about. And um, in this chapter two, I try to show people, just remind them of what the parts of speech are, and then talk about what are some of the issues for ESL learners. Probably one of the best examples here, I think, would be um, nouns, because if we ask people to name a part of speech, nouns would be the first one that they would name. And with nouns, of course, for a native speaker, we tend to think of proper nouns, common nouns, do you capitalize it, etc. But in the ESL world, that's not an issue. The number one issue with nouns probably would be count and non-count. The fact, first of all, that in English we have nouns that we count, such as cat and dog, which would have, that can have an S, so they have a plural form, so you have one cat, two cats. But uh, we also have words like uh, machinery. We don't have seven machineries in English, or more probably closer to home for the ESL students would be homework. I'm sure if you've been teaching, even for a short time, you've heard students say, tonight we have three homeworks. Well, actually you do have three homeworks, but we don't say that in English. We have to say three assignments. So this brings up the issue of count and non-count nouns, and it goes way beyond just putting an S or not. For example, many books, you don't say much books. Why not? Well, it has to do with count and non-count nouns. This is a good example, I think, of how uh, you would take the parts of speech in English and expand that uh, into some uh, pretty simple ESL points. But that's just the beginning. That's a reminder to help you make the transition from, I guess, kind of nudging your grammar knowledge back into shape and then getting ready for the real meat of the book, which is chapter three. Chapter three consists of 15 ESL or EFL grammar points. And I could have, I could have done 50 easily. 
but that would have been way, way overkill. And in fact, you don't need 50. Um, I decided to cover 15 grammar points that I know from my experience teaching now for 30 plus years that these are problems that, uh, problem areas for grammar for ESL students, whether you're teaching second graders in Japan or you're teaching adults um, here in Florida. Um, for example, we have verb tenses, uh, count and non-count nouns, if clauses, uh, using wish, uh, past perfect tense, um, prepositions, articles, and a couple of others there. And that's chapter three. And chapter three is the bulk of the book. Um, the chapters in chapter three can be done in any order be, um, because it's meant to be, in some ways, it's a handbook, a, um, an easy reference book. So if you wanted just to talk about prepositions, you would go look at the, the, the key. Again, they're called keys. There are 15 grammar keys that I'm dealing with there. And there, now, how, does, how is this book different from other books that are on the market? Well, first of all, if you know any of my books, it, they're written in what people call accessible English. Um, and it's designed for teachers because I, I'm a, I am a teacher and I've taught my whole life and I'm going to keep on teaching. And I think that people who do teacher training, it, it, it behooves us uh, to write in language that's accessible to teachers. Or if not, what's the point? So this book is written in very accessible language. Uh, but a, a, a big difference is that in addition to covering the grammar, which is what chapters two and three especially do, I have two, two additional chapters that are designed really just for classroom teachers. Chapter four is one of the, the best things I think that teachers are really going to enjoy, and that's called the hot seat questions. I know when I started teaching uh, 30 plus years ago, I would get into a classroom and have my lesson prepared about whatever the teaching point was or the reading or the writing, and then suddenly a student would raise a hand and asked me, why does the verb have an ing here? Why do you say I enjoy playing tennis? Why not I enjoy play tennis? Or I enjoy to play tennis? Or I enjoy, I enjoy uh, played tennis? And honestly, I've never thought about those things. And all of us who have taught have had those moments where you're at the blackboard and horror of horrors, it's what I call the hot seat question. You're, you're, you, you know, you're on the hot seat and you have 30 people looking at you who want an answer, and you're the teacher and should have an answer, but you don't have a clue as to what's happening at that particular time. Well, that's okay when you're first starting out, but uh, I, it took me 20 years or so before I really and truly felt comfortable with grammar, and now I, I, I love those questions um, you know, to push me to think about things I haven't thought about before. But there has to be a better and faster way that would... Uh, not put you through the grief that I did as I had to stand there at numerous blackboards and green boards and white boards over the years. And so that's what this chapter does. There are uh, 20 hot seat questions and each one is a question that students actually have asked me or I've seen asked in class. Uh, I think the first one is, uh, teacher, which, which is correct, uh, a big house or a house big? And that one might seem pretty easy to you, but you will start getting uh, other questions. I'll give you a good example. At a conference last week, I was asked by a teacher when I explained this, and I said, I asked the audience, does anyone here have any questions? And there were many K-12 teachers there and many brand new ESL teachers. And the question that was asked was, how do you know when to pronounce the ED as a D or an ED? And, and then I proceeded to explain that actually there are three pronunciations, D, T, and, and the ID, as in uh, a word like sneezed is sneezed, and a word like cough is coughed. And a word like uh, divide is divided. So that you all you write ed every single time, but really the ending is not the same. How do you know when to put each of those endings? And the common uh, answers that we native speakers tend to give is because that's how we say that, which is really not a very helpful thing for your students. Or um, because English is like that. Well, that still doesn't tell me what's up. Or then people will say, it's an exception. And I have to really smile when I hear that because then the, the logical question from the ESL student is, okay, well, which one is the exception? The D, the T, or the ED? Or is it, are they all exceptions? Well, grammar, again, everybody's kind of, a, not everybody, but many teachers are afraid of grammar, but grammar by definition is just a system of patterns. And there is a pattern there, you're just not aware of it yet. So chapter four with those 20 hot seat questions will help speed up your ability to answer some of these very common questions that you just never thought about before. But wait, there's more. Chapter five, we have one last chapter there. And what chapter five does is actually offer 25 solid, uh, real classroom teaching techniques. So for example, um, there's a, the, how to do a drill. 
Um, if you're a brand new teacher, you probably don't even know what a drill is, or you read about it in your history of language teaching, and they would mention something about drills or associated with the audiolingual method and how horrible that the audiolingual method was and how horrible a drill is because it's confining and contrived, etc. But the reality is, yeah, that maybe that method or any method isn't so good if that's all you do for 50 minutes five times a, a week. But being able to do a drill on the spot for 30 seconds, not a second more than that, 30 seconds worth of intense practice on a grammar point says a whole lot about your ability to, to teach. You can't do that. You can't, you can't practice the technique of doing a drill on the spot if you don't know the grammar point. And that's the first thing. You have to know the grammar point and what the exceptions are so that you don't give an exception in your uh, drill, for example. But doing a drill takes practice. Uh, some people might be good at it naturally, but the average teacher needs practice at this. And that's what I hope is going to happen in Chapter 5. We also have some appendices in the back for different grammar points that you might not be so sure of, including um, a, a glossary of terms. Uh, again, grammar is not about terms, but when I mention grammar to novice teachers, you can see their face freeze up already, and then they'll say, they always refer to uh, those terms. I don't know what present perfect is. Well, you do need to know what it is, but that's not what you teach in class. Um, and I would also add that there is a workbook available for this as well for those who need additional practice. Some of those exercises might seem redundant to some of you, those of you who know what a noun and verb is already, but I'm, I don't, I've learned not to take those kind of things for granted anymore. And the whole point of this book and the workbook together is to help teachers feel comfortable with grammar, as they should be, because I really don't see how you can teach ESL or EFL if you don't know English grammar. Um, also, I should mention that um, I deal with grad students, and uh, the graduate students that I deal with, um, again, some of them don't even have teaching experience yet, but they're very interested in TESOL or they want to go overseas, and they um, need additional help um, as well with, with, um, with uh, grammar. Um, the, the really good thing, I think, about this workbook, or the, sorry, the, the, the book itself is that the book doesn't assume anything. So. Uh, it does assume that you love ESL and you really want to do this, um, but regardless of the grammar knowledge that you have already, um, it really will help you there. Now, people who are in graduate school, um, also in the, in the graduate courses that I teach, such as one on grammar for ESL students, or teaching grammar for, to ESL, ESL students, um, are also interested in doing research on this. So in each of the chapters, there is a, a mini research project. Um, your professor or your instructor may want you to do additional um, secondary research in the library or on the internet, but what I tried to concentrate on here was rather than looking at studies of how grammar has been taught or could be taught or studies of certain kinds of uh, a grammar or aspects of grammar, I would like my graduate students to actually become familiar with what this grammar point looks like in the real world and at the same time take into account uh, the needs of your students, your, stu your ESL students down the road. So for example, um, if uh, I want you to look at verb tenses and take the 12 verb tenses in English, we could spend, for example, equal amount of time on all 12 of the verb tenses, but that wouldn't be good teaching because those 12 verb tenses are not used equally in the real world. And then the question would, would be, well, so what is the real world for my students, meaning my ESL students down the road or your ESL students? If you are going to teach uh, students, suppose you're, you're in an EFL setting and you're teaching uh, students in Japan or pick any country actually and they're uh, working with tourists. So I'll, I'll pick Argentina. Suppose you're in Buenos, your students are in Buenos Aires, Argentina and they're working with the tourists who are going there who are English speakers and you need to put together a course or materials to help these Argentinians practice enough English to be good with the tourists that are there. Well in this case then what they need is spoken language, it's not written language. They're not going to be reading books when they're on their job. They're not going to be reading tourist brochures because they'll actually know the places in Buenos Aires. But they are going to have to speak to people. And so um, most of the activities in the book practice what I'm going to call corpus studies. A corpus just means that you have a body of language representing whatever your final target, your final goal is. So in this case, we would try to imagine what is, what is uh, something that a tourist would ask the guide, or what are things that the guide would have to talk about when they're explaining Buenos Aires. And that's, that's the language that, um, that we're going to analyze. It will be transcripts of that. Uh, another example might be, for example, 
that your students are going to function in an academic setting at a university. So they need to be able to function in a science lecture or a history lecture. Uh, because of that, some of the activities in the book ask you to go to the, uh, the Michigan Corpus of Academics book in English, um, and, which is available on the web for free. And I have my students go to that website and download a transcript of an actual lecture, and then their job, their task is going to be to analyze 1,000 words. That's not a very big um, transcript, really. In fact, it's a small segment of the transcript. Analyze 1,000 words of that transcript and then go through and mark every single verb tense. But first I have them predict, okay, this is a lecture about, I don't know, about gravity, let's say. So it's gravity is something that happens all the time. It's not a past thing, it's not a future thing. So what verb tense do you expect to happen in this lecture? And most people would predict present, simple present tense. And that may be, in fact, what is used. I don't know, and I'm not gonna tell you. You have to actually do this task yourself, as my students will. But they'll start out by choosing a 1,000 word segment or whatever, whatever the keys book asks them to take. They'll look at the 1,000 word segment and then they will um, analyze for uh, the verb tenses by underlining all the verb tenses and then going through with a chart and simply counting out how many simple present tense occurrences there are, how many simple past, how many past perfect, etc. But before we do that, of course, I ask them to predict on a separate sheet what they're going to find and then they actually carry out the task. And the question that I'm trying to get them to answer is, um, how good am I at being able to predict what happens in the real world? Because the whole point of teaching grammar uh, is to be able to function in English in some way. And what the number one thing that you as a teacher need to do is ask yourself or find out by asking the students, what do your ESL students want to do down the road with English? And then you work backward from that trying to figure out how you can help them and that would entail figuring out what is the grammar that your students are going to need.